we do a mic check, please? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks on the Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America. The DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. Hey everybody, welcome back. We have today an episode that can be viewed a bit as a a companion uh, podcast to a recently released episode of Ducks Unlimited TV, where we were over in Arkansas at Bill Byers Hunter Club, uh, participating, taking advantage of the early spec season there. And so this episode is going to kind of cover a a bit of a recap of that, what we experienced there on the hunt. I have here in studio with me, Cason Short, the owner, operator of Bill Byers Hunter Club. Cason, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. And the other thing that I'll kind of do is just put a timestamp on this. You and I are recording this on November 11th of 2022. I guess it just kind of gives you an idea of the amount of time it takes to to get a DU TV filming like in the field to actual production and then release. So it will take almost a year. Right. So you had the idea when we were over there, I guess, two weeks ago that, hey, it'd be a good idea to get in the studio and do a recap of this or some things that we want to talk about, but we need to do it before too much time passes because we'll forget about it. Uh, So appreciate you having that suggestion. Appreciate you stopping by here today. I do want to cover a bit of background for people people that may have may not have heard the episodes at the podcast episode that you were on last year uh, you and Chris Jennings sat down and talked about the history of, of the of your property there that was episode 415 history of family resources and conservation at Bill Byers Hunter Club I encourage people to go back and listen to that episode it talks about um, well those things the history of, of that property there and I'll say that I listened to it before going over to participate in that DUTV filming and it answered a lot of the questions that I would have had whenever I walked in about the the chainsaws and right. some of the other parts of, of sort of the history and how long it had been in existence. So it's a great story. I encourage people to go listen to that episode 415 from, I guess it would have been October of, of 2022. For people that, that may not have listened to that, and are tuning in here. I want want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself again and talk a little about the 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 club that you have there, the property that you own. And so let's just just introduce yourself and your property again to our people. Yeah. So I'm Case in Short, as as you stated. Uh, I'm the grandson of Bill Byers. Uh, as this comes to air, we'll be uh, on our way to entering our 70th anniversary uh, at that farm. We started in 1953, guiding waterfowl hunts. It's kind of I guess a family tradition at this point. It's the only thing I've ever really known consistently. Grew up around it and watched it kind of evolve um, from from the early days of the point system and lead shot to what it is today. So I've seen a lot of trends come and go in waterfowl over that time frame and was really lucky to have two mentors who also spent a lifetime in the waterfowl world and taught me from an early age, you know, that conservation is paramount to our success, that we have a resource we have to take care of. And above all, if we don't, take care of that resource. We will not have a sport to pass on. So always been conservation minded, always cared about the land and the resource and try to daily, you know, put those practices to work. And so in terms of the operation that you have there, it's it's fair to call it an an outfitter operation. You, you um, sell hunts to clients that come in and uh, from all across the U S you have folks that come in from far and wide. Yeah, we, there's certainly some some hotbed areas. We have a lot of folks in the East Coast pretty routinely, but uh, people from all across the country and have had for years. Um, you know, like I said, we started in 53. So I remember my grandfather in the early 50s uh, would hunt 100 people a day through what at that point was the, the one room portion of our clubhouse. If you remember that, we showed you that guy yeah. in the dining yep. room. You know, we still have that portion of the building. Um, so it is. It's a guide service. It has been since its start. And it kind of at times will ebb and flow a little bit. That's It's it's a young man's game. I think I mentioned that to Chris when I was talking to him. So we have our, – even our business has kind of gone through cycles up and down over the time frame. And maybe that's one thing that I really learned from my father and grandfather. 
that you have to be a little reserved about how you go about it because you can burn out. You can get too much of it. And it also, having that mindset, I think also lends itself to managing gun pressure. So we manage gun pressure and it takes a little pressure off of us and it allows me to, to keep doing it and, and take care of it. And you talked about that on the previous episode, the episode from last year about how important managing that pressure is. And there's numerous different ways that you implement that management. Like when we were out there, you there's sort of a, a time limit on how long we stay out. It's mm-hmm. 9 or 9.30. 9.30 is pushing it, and it's only under certain circumstances where you said that that, that you would stay, you and your, your clients would stay out that long. And I know all of that is designed to to, to give the birds some rest, right? To, mm-hmm. to let them um, give them a, a safe place because that's something that we know ducks and geese need places to, to get away from that pressure. And that's something that y'all have clearly done a fabulous job with. You, you do it on the, from a time perspective, you do it from a space perspective, certain parts of the, of the farm you talked about that y'all don't go there. And during, or you minimize the amount of time that you spend there. You close off some roads and all types of stuff. So I think y'all have certainly figured that out from an early, uh, from the early days of of the the work that the, the operation that you have there. And I think other people are picking up on that as well. Do you you hear that a lot in Arkansas nowadays? You're starting to hear it a lot more. Um, and oddly enough, you know, one of the things we talk about is early water too. Um, that's kind of the reason that the we have that resource there with the white fronts. But I had a drone in the air yesterday. And I was amazed at how much water I could see off in the distance around us. And 10 or 15 years ago, most people would wait until a few days before the season to start pumping. So I I think a lot of that, people are starting to hear the message. You know, early water, limit pressure, you're hearing more of it, you're seeing more of it. And I think it's going to start having a a pretty good impact. There are probably probably a few things that I want to come back to and and talk with you about in terms of the management on the area. And and particularly as it relates to what we saw during our time there as part of the DUTV film shoot. But I want to go there now and just kind of do a recap of that. What were we, what was the... um, the theme of that particular episode was uh, was obviously exposing people, our viewers, to the early white front season in Arkansas, and we had with us uh, a fantastic group of people. I mean, I was I was honored to be part of that group, and uh, I, I guess you know John Gordon here who manages and produces the show at least from from within Ducks Unlimited and helps identify the places where these episodes will be recorded and filmed. Uh, he asked me if I wanted to to participate in it. I guess they wanted somebody to talk about white fronts and kind of be there to answer a few questions and so but it was really cool for me to be part of that group, be part of it with you and your staff there along with folks like uh, Doug Larson, a host of the of DUTV for a number of years. Uh, Jim Ronquist, a great friend and partner in conservation from Drake Waterfowl, uh, Brooke Richard, Higdon Outdoors, and I'm sure we'll talk about how good of a spec caller Brooke is here sure. for yeah. too long. And then other folks like Andrew Jones from Yeti, um, and then who else? Feel like I'm I'm forgetting a few. Well, all the, the crew from from Moose Media, from Mossy Oak, uh, Ed Wall, the photographer. Uh, I mean, it was it was a fantastic group, and I just I was honored to be part of it. Uh, it was a great group of people. I guess the dates on that were when we were there, what did I, I wrote that down here somewhere, October 29th through the 31st, opening weekend of the early spec season there in Arkansas. And um, you and others had worked on kind of lining up where we were going to hunt. And we we actually ended up doing three mornings of hunts. The second day was, was way more challenging and we ended up sticking around for a third day to ensure that as kind of part of what you have to be aware of in the in the TV business is you got to make sure you get the right, you get enough shots, quality shots, because it's, there is no guarantee that when you go on, on one of these hunts that you're going to get the the birds and that you're going to get the birds that work the way you want them to, to produce the shots that you need um, to make a good, attractive uh, episode. So we ended up doing three days. So I want you to talk about sort of that first morning. And, and again, I encourage people to watch the DUTV episode this, we're trying to provide a little additional context to what we saw and the sort of the setup, where we were, and why we went to that particular location on that first day. So take us through that on day one. So we were we were hunting in a field that we call Black Mound. Uh, typically, you almost have to have a north wind to hunt there. And and if you look at it in the episode, you can see that uh, with a north wind, you've got the wind to your back and you're shooting birds in the field in front of you. Behind you, if you can see it in the footage, we've got an inside ditch that we call it, and then another grass road in the field behind us. So wind is paramount to your success there. And we had the north wind that morning. 
we're down there close to our rest pond, very close proximity to it. So we're really close to the roost and we'll see if it makes the cut. But one of the things that we talked about there and one of the toughest decisions I made that day was the very first shot that we didn't call. And we had a bunch of birds in the air and they were working. And at any moment, I thought we'd get that entire spin down on us. And we passed a chance at one or two, you know, individual shots there and just ended up not calling it. They kind of figured it out and they left and we ended up having a great hunt as they worked their way back to us. But being that close to the roost and that close to that many birds that are, are used to being there, the last thing that I wanted to do was educate all of them to kill one. So that's kind of a, as a guide, there's usually any of 10 or 20 different scenarios playing out in your head while you're trying to make a split second decision on what's best for TV and all these other huge personalities that you've got in a blind. But so it's a lot of fun, uh, both in the white front and duck hunting to hunt down there like we did on the first day because you're you're close to that 230 acre field that never gets hunted. When the birds get up and move off of it, you've got a lot of good stuff going on. You're seeing a lot of birds moving and it's it's really exciting. Now, there's some drawbacks to it too as well. And even like Brooke commented about that, you know, you're calling out a bird who's looking 400 yards past you at 10,000 real birds and you've got to be a really good caller to have any impact in that situation. But it's always... I'd rather go and see birds than, than go and not. So, you know, most of the time we'll take our chances being that close to it. But it's uh, it's different in a sense that you've got a lot of birds looking at you, but you need that really high volume to have success too. And we'll see that, you know, kind of as we move on to day three, when the scenario changed, we were hunting on a feed. It's a really totally different setup than than where we were the first day. I also found it interesting. You mentioned the, the number of well-known personalities that we had in, in the blind uh, that are very accomplished waterfowl hunters. Uh, I don't consider myself one of the <laughs> one of those in either of the cases, but it was the first time that I had ever been part of a, of a TV uh, filming uh, production. And it was also pretty obvious to me that it was the first time that most of us had hunted together outside of your crew. We, we were in a pit and I think we were all trying to figure out, um, you know, who was calling the shot, who was, you know, we had Jimbo down on the, on the far end with his dog and dog is a, t- a tiny, tiny man. It was a fantastic dog. And that will be great footage uh, alone. Sure. But it felt to me like early on that morning, we were trying to get our bearings sort of as a group who was going to, cause we were standing up. Most of us were standing up and right. looking up way too much. And yeah. then finally we're like, Hey, let's just let the people that are calling be the ones to look up. And the rest of us got down in the blind and, and stayed there. And then things started to come together. I think a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Were you sensing that you've hunted with a lot of people and I'm sure in your mind, you're constantly critiquing what the group is doing. Oh, for sure. And it's, that's uh, again. That's kind of part of of being down there next to that roost like that. Like it's a it's a big show, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to go there and be that close because it's it's awesome to see that sight when they get up. But it also paralyzes people a little bit, you know. And, and I I fall victim to it. We'll stand there and you're you're standing up. You're not even trying to hide. And you're like, man, we're not doing very good. They're not finishing. Well, no kidding. Like we <laughs> had to even attempt to sit down, you know. And that's another interesting thing. You mentioned that's your first time you know, with a, a film crew, it is not for me, even even knowing what to expect going out with a film crew, it's so much more challenging than people will ever understand. I'm sure people will watch an episode and say, well, you know, they didn't kill that many, or you may really critique some of the footage that you see, but nobody in their right mind would ever go out and take two humans and sit them out on a levee with a giant black camera in their hand and expect to have the same success that if you and I went and were in a layout, you know? So, there's a lot of hurdles to overcome that you don't see when you're watching a show and it it has an impact. And then when you've got all of us standing there staring too, that, that doesn't help. Yeah, for sure. So we had had three cameramen. Uh, one was outside and the amount of coordination and planning that went into that and they're all connected on their headsets. They've got in-ear microphones or in, in-ear uh, earpieces and uh, several of us were mic'd up. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I found interesting is that, you know, the cameraman outside the blind, th- that earpiece is really critical for him, for him because he needs to know where the birds are that you're calling because you got to kind of coordinate the birds that he's filming with the birds that you're calling and trying to get to, that, that are likely to be, to be shot. And so those types of uh, sort of the behind the scenes aspect of a film crew and, and you know kind of TV production were pretty interesting for me to to observe and and yeah it was it was a lot of different parts of that were pretty cool having the 
I guess at one time we had both. So we had two of the film, uh, two of the camera guys in the blind with us, which was interesting in terms right. of space. On the second day, that was more challenging in the same in the from a wind perspective. It basically meant that the shots were kind of concentrated on one end of the blind, and one of the um, guy Shepherd, one of the cameramen, was trying to get some shots of the people that were shooting. So I found myself just having to sit down most of that morning. I said, "Look, yeah. guy, you getting shot to the people that are shooting uh, is more important than me getting a shot. So you just go ahead and do your thing." So that kind of stuff kind of came into it as well. And but yeah. that's what you have to do with a with a film crew uh, on that type of situation, right? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just it's different than. Then if you and your buddy went to go hunt and you're and you're trying to kill birds, obviously that's that's the goal is you want to kill birds, but you have to kill them the right way where the cameraman can get the shot that he wants while while you're doing your part too. And it's a lot to orchestrate that. And you mentioned that there on the second day. <clears throat> you know, we had the wrong wind. We had a south wind that day. So the birds were setting up in the wrong direction. Now, that's not to say that that can't be done at that blind. We went back the next weekend. I took my sons and we had a great hunt with the wrong wind, but we weren't trying to film it. We didn't have cameramen outside the blind. I mean, you know, so there's a lot of hurdles, uh, but it's still a, it's a lot of fun. And then, two, the size of our group, we had a great group of people, but we kind of had a huge group of people, too. So yeah, we were really we handicapped to where we could go. Yeah. By the third day, some folks had to leave. Um, we scaled back a little bit, and we, we had some more options and, and got on a really good hunt that third day. And that, that first day was good, too, but it took a while for us to get there. Mm -hmm. We had that big... The, the, the big group of birds got up off of the refuge and then they circled and you talked about how we passed on the shot. But then it was quiet for about a, an hour and a half. And we picked off a few here and there, mm -hmm. but we didn't get we didn't get any large concentrations or steady, you know, um, one group right after the other uh, group of birds working until, what, after the 8 o'clock hour? And maybe as the birds started to, to work back, I think we ended up finishing around 8.40, something like that. And that's a great that's hunt, right. make no mistake. But there was a lull there for an hour or so. And I think we were, there was part of us that were kind of wondering, is this is it going to do it today? Yeah. But it, it did. And so kind of talk about that. Whenever you saw those birds kind of, were they, did our improved success there later in the morning uh, reflect the birds kind of coming back, working their way back to the refuge? Is that what you think was happening? I do. I think so. Because I remember I looked at my watch at 7.30 and we may, be, we may have been like halfway there. I thought, okay, that's kind of tough. We might not get there today. Typically, being that close to our rest pond, it's really quick and it's really fast or it's not. Um, if it takes a long time, especially with ducks, it's a lot, lot slower if you miss kind of that early early morning movement. And I think with the white fronts, because they kind of wake up in mass and exit to go feed, we didn't take advantage of a lot of that that morning. We were standing up. We were all kind of figuring it out, as you said. Um, as the hunt went on, you kind of reach that lull in between. They've left the roost. Now they're out feeding. And as we approach the 8 o'clock hour, now you're getting them coming back to us. And that's when it kind of picked up. And we had some really good groups that finished. And, and we finished our hunt there about 840. Yeah, it was should be some good footage uh, from that, from the close. Well, from throughout the morning. And ended up with, I guess, our nine-man limit of specs. I believe we had nine guns uh, in, in, the, in the pit there. Great hunt. Uh, got back. And then the breakfast was fantastic as well. And then we went, I guess that would have been a Saturday. So we watched some football and, and so forth. We missed the rain. I think there was a, a threat of rain that morning, mm -hmm. opening morning. Uh, that didn't materialize, but then it rained overnight. And then the, the north wind came through. Was it a north wind that we were dealing with the next day? We had a south wind. South wind the next, um, which was a two. bit odd, I guess. Maybe it was. I'm trying. That is odd. Probably that front. I'm not remembering correctly the way that front came through or what kind of system we were dealing with there. But anyway, it changed. It rained overnight, mm -hmm. which was the first rain y'all had had in weeks or months, yeah. right? Yeah, first rain of any significance. And so then we went back out the next day. And so just kind of talk briefly about what we were dealing with there. I don't know how much footage, footage people are going to see of day two because I think we had maybe he ended up with 11 birds that next day, something like that, 11 or 13? Yeah, somewhere right there, you know, uh, halfway to a, to a limit of the people we had. And they might not see much or even recognize that they're seeing it. You know, it may be a lot of in-blind stuff that they're going to see, kind of B-roll type stuff. So I know just from working with TV before, like, they don't really want to... gets cut, right? right. They don't really want to see him getting shot at 30 yards, you know, kind of passing shots. and But it just, the wrong wind direction. So think about anytime you set up, if you have the wind in your face and the birds are coming from behind, you're having to turn 180 degrees to get that shot. Uh, so as they set up, they're trying to land out 
in front of us, but you've got to get your decoys out away from the levee far enough that they're not tucked in tight the wrong way to a levee. So it's just an awkward setup altogether, and then it doesn't make for, for great TV ultimately. Now, I think the first morning we were forecasted like a 10-mile-an-hour north wind, and we had like three to four. So going into day two, we, we kind of know we have to go there based on the group size, right? But they're talking a four-mile-an-hour south wind. I'm like, all right, well, if they're wrong again and it's calm, then we'll be okay and this will work. But it was ended up, it was, you know, about a 10-mile-an-hour south wind. So the weatherman is never right when you need him to be. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing on that, on day two, and I kind of referenced this earlier, sort of in-blind safety became an, an issue. Or, I mean, it's always an issue. It's always something to be aware of. But the birds were mostly, they were high shots, as you talked about, and most of them were coming off of one end of the blind. Mm -hmm. And so it's a situation where not everyone can turn and, and fire at right. them. So we had like two or three hunters at the far end of the blind that for the most part did most of the shooting. And that was, I think, Doug and, and Jimbo. And they were uh, they, they, they got their birds. And so then we had a few others from the other other side, I guess. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of that that we saw happening. And um, so got out of the field by what nine nine thirty? We might have stayed till nine thirty on that. I think day. we did. Yeah, trying to get a few more that day, and it just didn't never really materialize the way uh, the camera crew camera camera crews would like for it to. So then I guess throughout the day on Sunday we had some conversations about sticking around, and you were gracious enough to to say, yeah, we can we could probably do another another hunt in the morning. Actually, I'm probably not giving you enough credit. You're like. Guys, just tell me. If you need more footage, we'll make it happen, you know, and, and so thank you for that. And so I want to get into that, uh, to, to that hunt. It was a different situation. We had a smaller group. Several people, as you said, had to leave, and so that allowed us to go to a different site. Before we talk about that, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll wrap up the hunt, but then there's a few other things we'll talk about as well. So, so hang with us, folks. Stay tuned to the Ducks Unlimited podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, after these messages. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Cason Short of Bill Byers Hunter Club, and we are recapping a Ducks Unlimited TV episode uh, that aired recently. It was a hunt from fall of 2022. Uh, taking advantage of the early spec season in Arkansas. And we're moving on now to day three. So talk with us about the difference there. We had six hunters on that day. That's a big difference. But what did that allow us to do and what are people going to be seeing? So that's a really a really interesting spot that we hunted on day three. And it's really one of my favorite places on the farm. So we reforested about half of that with a partners program with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in 2013. So those trees... Uh, if you see them to our back, are about nine years old when we shot that. I grew up, obviously, that was a field when I was a kid. I remember it as such. There's still an old pit that's in the ground back there in those trees. So every time I walk through there, it's really amazing to look at it and see the evolution that's going on year to year with it. It's a really good testament to what we what we have the power to change if we want to, if we want to restore habitat to, to what it was. And obviously... When my grandfather bought that, it was all bottomland hardwoods, just beautiful piece of property. And it still is. I love agriculture, and that's, you know, we, we make a living doing that. But there's something special about kind of an untouched piece of land. So I say all that to say, I guess a lot of times when you think about WRE or reforesting, you think just about ducks and, and so forth. So it was interesting to go out there on that line of those trees like that and still harvest white fronts out in front of it. And we hunted out of a I mean, more of a timber blind than what you would expect to hunt geese out of. So it's much more comfortable, fewer people. The wind, we had a, a west wind. You know, Brooke and I talked about it that afternoon, or Saturday, after, excuse me, Sunday afternoon when we went and scouted it. We looked at kind of the way that the trees are designed there through a draw. So when, when we planted it, we knew we wanted the trees to kind of bow outward up the draw. And it was kind of almost by design, like you would design a golf course. Well, with the west wind, we knew they would enter the field to our right, follow the wind, come right around that point, and land in the decoys crossing right to left. Luckily, the weatherman got that forecast right, the wind was right, and they did exactly what we thought they would do. Um, and we worked several big groups. Yeah. Really, really nice. And we talked about that a little bit on Sunday. I tried to explain the difference. Like, okay, we're on this other end of the farm. We're further away from the respawn. 
it's not gonna you're not gonna see a ton of birds. It's a totally different situation. It's the other side of the coin. Yeah. But, but they, when those birds came came around that corner, they wanted to be right there. They did. We were hunting on the feed, and they'd been there, you know, all that week. They'd been feeding and eating right there. Um, so it's just it's as opposite as you can get from day one. But it was really a lot of fun to go do it and go show everyone that had been there. This is the other side of what what we can do too. Yeah, that was really cool. A uh, really cool hunt for me. Uh, so it was a harvested rice field out mm-hmm. in front. That's where the decoys were set. That's where the birds wanted to be. It's where being, they had been feeding, as you talked about. And then the timber was behind us. And the blind is a. Uh, I mean, it's it's obvious that that y'all flood that area later on, right? Because right. it's it has a boat shed on the back of that blind. I mean, yep. this was a, it was more of a duck hunting blind than sure. a goose hunting, hunting blind. How often do you hunt geese out of that? I'm kind of curious of that. Uh, on purpose, that was the first time. Really? Yeah. It, yep. it might change your thinking. Yeah, it worked. I mean, <laughs> it was good. And, and You have another option now anyway. Sure, yeah. It was nice to see it work that way. And as we looked, you know, as we looked at it that day, we walked out there, they'd been using it. You could see where they had been in the low spots, tracks everywhere. Like, all right, this is going to work, you know, but you wouldn't, yeah, myself wouldn't that wouldn't be necessarily be my first choice. You know, you just you know, kind of thought outside the box. Like, look, let's go somewhere else and let's get where they want to be. Which is the look. That's the number one game of duck hunt, right? Yeah. Go where they want to be. Well, and it was great from a filming uh, perspective as well because there was better cover mm-hmm. around the around the blind. Uh, like, or we had two guys outside the blind, um, and they were. I don't know if one of them had on their ghillie suit. Uh, it might have. I think one of them had on the ghillie suit that so. day. And, I mean, they just they just disappeared right into that, that brush line. And the other thing that, that was really cool for me and others in the blind, especially if you're not calling, is that the overhead cover in that blind seemed to be a bit thicker than what we had in the pit blind. So I was able to look up without fear of them seeing my face or flaring the birds and able to witness the spectacle that was unfolding as these birds came around and they were kind of doing their maple leafing or slip sliding or whatever people, however many different terms people have for it. But it was an incredible sight, fantastic footage of that. The birds were working exactly as you described they would. They had positioned the cameramen outside exactly where they needed to be so that they're getting the birds as they're committing. And then as we're taking the shots, had one guy in the blind filming. And and so it was, that was pretty cool. And so I remember at the end of that, I mean, they were, so there were six of us, uh, got our six-man limit in pretty short order. Was it under an hour? It was going to be close to it. Close to an hour, I think. Yeah. So uh, I think I want to say shooting light that morning was 6.59 and we were done before eight or right at eight. So, yeah. yeah. And I remember close. you and and Guy, Guy coming up to you or you asking Guy afterwards, was that, was that good enough to get your, to get your shots? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, we got, we got what we needed. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. We're talking to Joe afterwards and we had two big groups, one really big group that finished just phenomenal. And you mentioned the overhead cover in the blind, so it was a lot easier to hide. I never felt like they saw us, you know, compared to a pit where you're having to use grass and other brush. You know, you have to blend to your environment. So the the woods and the brush there worked a lot better. But it handicapped us a little bit too. When that group was working right to left, I would lose them kind of my sight line under the blind in front of us. I knew we had birds that had committed and gotten low on us, but I couldn't, I never turned my head and watched to see if they left. So you're watching the whole spin and the birds continue to stack up and you're thinking, all right, you know, do we do we have enough to call this shot? Is this time to do it? And there's still birds that are coming in. But Joe said he was starting to freak out. He said that we put 25 or so in the decoys and he was like, ah, oh, these guys ever going to shoot? <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the other things that I noticed you as a, as a guide, someone who's done that for a long time, we got to a point where we only needed a couple of additional birds. And so we were like, okay, we, we decided, you know, who's going to be shooting? And it was just a couple of us that were going to shoot depending on the situation that we, we had. We had a lot of birds come in. Only one or two people needed birds were going to shoot. But uh, maybe if we had just one bird, multiple people shoot to make sure we get that bird. Right. And so the one thing that I've found interesting is that, so I, I was one of the two people that was shooting there towards the end. And as I raised up, you were, you weren't shooting, you were calling the birds and calling the shot. I raised up to shoot. And all of a sudden I hear you say left. And so, and so that told me there are closer birds to the left to shoot at. Right. And, and so, uh, cause you saw me pointing to the ones yep. that were kind of out a little bit farther. And so I think the two that you're talking about that were to the left might have I don't know if they were on the ground, but they had come into an area where I couldn't see because sure. of the blind. Yeah. And so I suspect you have to do that a lot as a guide to kind of help people see where the birds are and to pick the ones that are in the best location for an effective shot. 
Yeah, and I try to, you know, in the name of safety, you have to be a little bit careful. Like, you don't want to just turn everyone loose and say, shoot whenever you feel like it, because that's obviously not safe. But I also try to explain to people, I don't see everything either. You know, like, I've got an idea of which one I'm calling to and what I think is working, but inevitably, you'll have one that slips in lower, quicker, gets in closer. I'm like, oh, man, I had no idea that was here. Like, if that happens, you know, feel free to tell me or, or you can act on your own. But, uh, yeah, it, it happens a lot Uh there's just a lot going on, and it's hard for everyone to see the exact same thing. And, all, of course, all your sight angles are different, too. Yeah. Well, that was a great hunt, a great way to cap off that uh, that that filming, and a great way to cap off the opening weekend. As best spec, spec hunt, three spec hunts I'd ever been on. I'm not a, I haven't been on a lot of those. I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Uh, talk about Jimbo's dog and the great retriever work that we got from, from Tiny Man. Oh, what was it someone said? I know they were quoting a, another celebrity and duck hunting but what is it he has two uh, three speeds here there and gone i mean <laughs> I forget what that was but <laughs> yeah he uh tiny doesn't walk anywhere no. he is full speed going and coming and, and i love and respect that about a dog i mean and and you see it you know we saw it with white fronts it's even more a concern when you're shooting teal down there so a, a dog that that works like tiny that will get the birds picked up quick sometimes will save a hunt you know you spend yeah. less time out chasing them so uh He's a phenomenal dog to get yeah. to hunt with. Well, even with a dog, an accomplished dog like Tiny, I noticed a couple of times when we had multiple birds down and if there were some cripples out there, you or Kyle or others in your team were immediately either out there to help the dog or to, if the dog was was busy picking up other birds, you were on your way to to get any kind of cripples that were farther out. That happened one time. Now, Tiny ended up catching up, catching up with you and passing you as you were out there, yeah. that one bird. But that's the type of stuff that you have to do. You know, nobody wants to see a crippled bird um, certainly get away. Nobody right. wants any bird ever to get away. And dogs are, are a tremendous asset in helping, uh, helping to reduce the chance of that happening. But there are other times where you can't solely leave it up to the dog. You got to make sure that you're out there because you knew that one bird that I'm talking about that I have in mind was making its way to maybe a creek or a ditch down there. Certainly some heavy vegetation, right? Yeah, I think he was headed to our little pond there behind the lodge, you know, 40 acres oh, of yeah. deeper water, big water. And it, you and I talked about that, about the instinct of that bird when he got his feet on him and stuck his head up, he knew exactly where he needed to go to be safe. And I mean, they make a living surviving, yeah. you know. We try not to ever lose one. And if we do, it's not because of lack of effort. And, yeah. you know, no no fault of the dog. He's got other cripples and other birds that he's picking up. We knocked down, I don't know, four or five in that group. And it's the furthest one away. So yep. unless you can make your dog forget everything that's right there in his immediate eyesight and go further, it's just, it's tough. And I knew the situation that we had in front of us. I'd seen it there before, so... Yeah, try to get out there and stop. Well, it. that all ended well and uh, a fantastic hunt, and then that was sort of the end of our uh, of our of our film session over there. Well, I guess we came back and did some other little interviews in front of the camera interviews type stuff. But great weekend, and so I appreciate you being part of that. Appreciate you offering Bill Byers Hunter Club as the the an option for a DU TV episode there. So I'm I'm excited. Like I said, we're recording this in November of 2022. I'm really excited to see how that episode comes out. By the time this ep- this podcast episode releases, it will be out, but you know, it's kind of a weirdness in the, in our timing of things yeah. right here. Um I did want to talk to you talk to you briefly, I guess. Um you've you'd hunted with Jim Ronquist before? Yes. Had you ever hunted with Brooke Richard? No, I had not. But you knew he was. He came into that as a um, a highly touted spec caller, right? Sure, I'd heard a little bit about Brooke. So how did he do? I mean, I was pretty impressed, and that's coming from someone who makes his own spec calls. Uh, that guy can run a spec call. I was impressed. I'm not a spec caller. I mean, I have one, but I've I've not used it a whole lot. Uh, but yeah, it was that was cool to be in a blind with so many people that are so accomplished. There, Jim Ronquist is starting to get into spec calling a little bit. He's pretty darn good himself, right? Yeah, we we may make a spec hunter out of him yet. I, yeah, I, mean, I know he loves shooting mallards in the woods, but he had a good time. I, it was it was hilarious that we had a hen mallard that was working the decoys that one day, and all of a sudden I hear. 
Jim break out his mallard call, and he, he just couldn't help himself. And no. he ended up landing the, the <laughs> landing the bird in the decoys. Of course, the honey, duck season wasn't open then, yeah. so the bird you know, flew off. But uh, he, he, he quit, was having fun. Yeah, he quit goose hunting. But Brooke and I are trying to call in geese. Like, what, Jimbo, what are you doing down there? And he's laughing, having a good time. <laughs> he said, I saw mallard. I went into mallard hunting mode. So, no, that was great. The other thing I wanted to do is just, you know, so we were, the club, the property that y'all have there is is still a working farm, a working rice farm primarily, right? You But you yep. rotate with soybeans. And and so I asked you if you had any, uh, you know, the the craze all over the country right now, and I get this a lot whenever people call saying they're going to come into possession or they're going to acquire some property and they want to manage it for waterfowl, waterfowl habitat. The first question is typically, what do I need to plant? And my, my response, I asked him questions about it. I'm like, well, I mean, have you tried just seeing what's in the seed bank itself through just some manipulation of the soil and proper water management? And let's just see what kind of natural vegetation gets up there. There was a time where waterfowl didn't have agricultural grains to feed on, and they evolved in the absence of that, you know, over, over millennia. So they'll eat those weed seeds, right? Right. And so you don't have any uh, hot crops. You don't have any... Uh, unharvested standing crops on on the place there. You do have some moist soil, right? That, or, or or are you planning to do that? Talk with me about that. Kind of what goes into your thought process of the the way you manage that property. So we do have a few acres. It can be moist soil depending on climate conditions during the summer. We will occasionally go in and plant some Japanese millet if need be, but it's minimal number of acres compared to the the three thousand that we have that's in ag. Just don't really, I, don't, I maybe don't have the luxury of going in and committing that many acres to, to leave standing. And then two, um, not that I disagree with it, uh, because I don't, you know, anything that's left for the birds is is a bonus. You know, if, if you're able to, to leave some grain for them, that's fantastic. We try harder to manage what is more natural to us in the terms of normal agricultural practices. And that comes into fall tillage, what we do with residue management. So we try not to roll any of our rice double down until basically this time of year, a little bit earlier. Now, we did some earlier this year. You and I talked about that when we were out there. Because of the drought, because of the severe low soil content, our soil moisture, wasn't really worried about rice germinating. Usually, we leave a rice double standing for that reason. If you don't have sunlight to the soil and you don't have soil contact moisture, you remove any one of those ingredients, then you preserve that grain a little bit longer. And we feel like, yes, we could go out and, and leave standing grain. Uh, it comes at a cost to us. It is much easier, kind of like moist soil. It is much easier to manage what's there than to spend money to have something else. And a lot of times it's it's better anyway, much like you mentioned, waterfowl survived without corn and rice before. They also adapted to normal agricultural practices before anyone hot cropped. So I guess it, to relate it to anything, it's kind of similar to, to moist soil. We just try to manage what's there and leave as much on the ground as possible. Yeah, I, I found that to be pretty cool. And I, I like the... I like some of those weedy areas that I saw around the edges of some of your field. I have to imagine those are incredibly attractive to to waterfowl. There was one area back in there amongst some of the timber that I saw that it looks like it's managed as moist soil. And I made the comment, like, I bet you there'll be some ducks in here once it gets flooded. And, you know, it's it's there is something to be said ecologically, biologically for offering something different um, from from a lot of the other things and that, that they may encounter on their landscape. They need a diverse diet, a nutritionally rich diet, and so that they have to find additional food resources from, from someplace. And so I think y'all do a great job of trying to provide some of that, especially within this other massive agricultural landscape where they, where they find themselves. And so that's it's pretty cool to, to see some of that, and, and kudos to, to you and your crew for all the work that y'all have done there. Another question that I wanted to ask you about is, or that I wanted to mention, and something that I asked you as soon as we walked in, or pretty soon after I got there, I said, how many, about how many birds do y'all harvest here annually? And your answer was interesting to me. So tell me about that. So I, I, we do not keep track. I do not count. Uh, I made the mistake of doing that a couple of times, as we talked about, and it really, you, you start setting, or I, me personally, I won't say that for everyone because not everyone's like me. I'm extremely competitive. I end up setting a, a bar that I want to get to, and you know, if you reach that number, then it becomes about the next number and the next number. And I realized in a period of a year or two there that that was not healthy and, and was not 
good for, for me. Um, I try to measure success based on the experience. Um, and that's kind of what we try to try to provide to our clients and our clientele and understands the experience. And that's what they want. They want to come to Arkansas and have the experience. It's not about how many ducks did we kill while we were there. I can look back and tell you years that were good and years that were bad. I've got a very good barometer for that, but actually counting and keeping track is not something that I do. Well, I found that unique and I found it, I found it commendable. It's almost as though you're valuing quality over the quantity you know if if you like you said if you start measuring something that becomes what you think more about sure. but if it's quality you know and quality is i guess you would say more of a uh, more of a subjective um, outcome anyway and so if you start focusing on that and the experience i thought that was pretty cool to learn and and I, I certainly couldn't argue with the approach that you're taking because the results, I think, as, as I experienced them, uh, certainly uh, bore out that you're, you're doing good in that regard. The final question that I guess I wanted to ask you here relates to your view over the years of this early spec season. We've, we talk, I think, a little bit on the uh, – people will see on the, the D TV episode about how white fronts have changed their distribution through time from the Texas coast, Louisiana coast, now into the Mississippi Alluvial Valley in the greatest concentrations and in other parts of the Mississippi and Central Flyway. And that has brought with it new opportunities for harvest. And in Arkansas – and I don't know how many other states do this, uh, but at least in Arkansas – Arkansas, there is now this early spec season. And so you've seen that. You've been there in Arkansas before that came on, on the landscape and as it's now on the landscape. What are your views on that? And do you think it's changed anything with the birds or with the way you manage things or with anything else about the hunting and the waterfowl landscape? So it's been really interesting to have a, a front row seat to the, the white front evolution over the last 30 plus years. We went from in the early 90s, you know, 91, 92, we would have 10 to 15,000 white fronts in the same time period of October that we just hunted. Before the early spec season, as we approached the first week of November, we would winter 100 to 150,000. We've seen that number trail off in recent years, and I can really only attribute that to this newfound pressure that they're experiencing. And through some of the telemetry data that we've got, we know that they're, they're picking up from Saskatchewan, they're flying you know, nonstop flights, they're landing in Northeast Arkansas, and they're doing it right in around the time frame of this early season. So now you've got a bird who has deplenished fat reserves to get here, and immediately they're being shot at. And and pressures obviously has a negative impact on waterfowl. We, we know that. So I do think it's having a negative impact on the resource. Uh, hunting does in general. I mean, you, I don't think anybody can deny that. But our numbers are decreasing a little bit every year. Um we kind of sat on the sideline for the first couple of years of this early season and kind of like, no, we're not going to do that, which we were also banding birds and we had a lot of other things going on that really prohibited us from doing it. We started to participate in it. Uh, it's a great opportunity to go. And without opportunities, we don't have hunters, we don't have new hunters, and we don't have a sport. So it's a delicate balance between managing for opportunities and managing to maximize the resource. Um, I guess in a perfect world, I would maybe rather see it just – maybe a couple weekends, not just a full-fledged 14-day stretch where they're getting hammered on by everybody. I, I think it might be time to look and see if maybe it's too much pressure than than what we originally intended because I don't think anyone really had the foresight to see some of the some of the images that we saw that weekend that we talked about from different places and, and numbers of people and things that were going on. It's uh, As one of my friends calls it, it's become the Wild West of hunting now. It's a little different, I think, than what anybody imagined and it's a lot of pressure. Now, we had a great time and I enjoyed it. And I'm all for hunter opportunity because that's an important thing. But I just from our small window looking at it, I think it's having a negative impact on the number of birds that we're holding. I listened to you talk about that and your perspective on it and your your thoughtful your thoughtful offering of of ideas. And I can't help but think back to the people that we always refer to as the, the pioneer thought leaders in our history of, of waterfowl hunting clubs dating all the way back to the 1800s, the early 1900s, how waterfowl hunting clubs were some of the first to implement restrictions, voluntary restrictions on hunting on their properties because they cared for the resource. They saw what, the res what was happening to the resource. They saw how their actions affected the resource and they wanted to take action to put in some some safeguards, 
that holds true to this day, and you're a, a great example of that. You and all the other waterfowl uh, habitat managers and club managers and that that think about this and that see those birds that that use their habitats, use their property year after year, and you have this relationship with the birds that I think the people that aren't in your shoes, me included, don't fully appreciate because it's they're part of the landscape. You know, people think about the if you own a farm, then that land and the the products that you produce from it are part of what you own. And so, the birds that you support, I suspect you feel like they are part of what that landscape is to you, that property is to you, and it just you couldn't imagine one without the other, right? And so that's what I think I'm hearing from you and you're not alone in this and that's a great thing. And it is one of the things that keeps waterfowl management, waterfowl hunters, um, I guess, as some of the best examples of conservationists that they're always thinking about this resource because they are providing for the resource. They're taking from the resource, but they're also recognizing what it takes to support it. And so I guess I'm just trying to make a link between people like you, modern day people that are thinking about this resource through a very through a, a very personal lens and then trying to imagine, is this good? Is this bad? What kind of decisions should we be making? And then you know, by extension, maybe that spills over into the decisions that federal state managers take at, at some level. Does that... Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves a lot or, or maybe about everything, you know, is is it good for the resource or is it bad? And I go back to one of the most fundamental things that my father and grandfather taught me and is that you have to put more back than you take away. I mean, it's no different than a, a bank account or anything else. You know, we have to take care of it. Otherwise, it won't, won't be there to enjoy anymore. Case and I appreciate your time here today. Thank you again for hosting Ducks Unlimited TV show over on your property. I'll also thank our, our partners there on that show, Higdon Outdoors, Drake Waterfowl, Mossio, Moose Media, um, whoever else, uh, Ed Wall, and and all the others that were involved in that. Yeti had, had, had somebody there. So appreciate everyone being part of that. Encourage y'all, if you haven't, go check out that episode on Ducks Unlimited TV. And, and yeah, catch them all. And, and uh Case and look forward to catching up with you again sometime in the future. Thank you, man. Thank you. I enjoyed it. A very special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Case and Short, uh, owner operator of Bill Byers Hunter Club over just north of Brinkley, Arkansas. As always, we thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the great job he does with these episodes, getting them out to you. And to you, the listener, we thank you for your time and for your support of wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to the DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit ducks.org slash DU Podcast. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Ducks.